Welcome to lecture 25 of biology 116 entitled blood slash immunity. What we're going to be focusing on now, now that we've established what circulation is all about, is looking at the circulatory fluid of circulation, and that is blood. That's going to be the first half of this lecture. And the second half of this lecture will still be sort of about blood, but looking at a specific component of blood, one of the major reasons we have blood, and that's its relationship to the immune system, otherwise known as immunity. So to begin this lecture, we'll first be focusing on blood, that circulatory fluid, by entitling the first flowchart as a background to blood. So it's about half of this lecture is going to be devoted to blood and looking at its components and how it functions, and then the other half will be about immunity. So let's begin by looking at blood. First of all, let's look at a bit of introduction to this circulatory fluid. First and foremost, the average a human body contains about 5 liters of blood. And this is going to be maintained throughout a person's life cycle. Now, in addition to the amount of blood that we carry, let's look at some of the functions of this blood. Why do we have blood? Generally speaking, blood is going to be useful in transport. As a circulatory fluid, it's going to move things around throughout the body. Those things will include nutrients and also hormones both of which need to get to the specific cells that need them. And the only way you can move nutrients and hormones and or transport them via blood is by making sure that the blood is a part of a circulatory system. So we'll just sub subtitle this over here as via CS, for circulatory system. That's how we move these things around and transport them to the place that they need to get to. In addition, blood will be useful in maintaining a proper fluid balance We'll talk more about this fluid balance as we move forward and look at a specific component of blood and its relationship to this fluid balance. And then finally, blood will also be important in pathogen defense. For right now, just understand that a pathogen is a foreign invader that we do not want in the body, and we're going to defend ourselves against those foreign invaders. Blood will be useful in that process. Therefore, blood will be useful in what we can term immunity. Those are the basic functions of blood that we'll be highlighting in greater detail as we move forward. In addition, an important understanding of blood is to look at its composition. We understand that structure and function both play a big role in any type of anatomy and physiology study. We've looked at the functions broadly speaking, now let's broadly look at the composition of blood. Blood contains many cells. There are many different types of cells within blood, and all of those cells are going to be found within a fluid. And that fluid, the liquid portion of blood, is something we've seen before in the previous lecture. It's referred to as plasma. That's the liquid, non-cellular portion of the blood, but there are going to be some cells within that. Those cells are going to be uh, known as red blood cells, RBCs for short, white blood cells. These will be very much involved in immunity, WBCs for short, and also these cell-like structures known as platelets. Not specifically cells, but they come from cells. We'll talk more about them once we get to them. That's our basic introduction to blood. What we want to now focus on is this, plasma, the non-cellular component of blood and how it relates to blood's overall function. So let's take a look here now at plasma. Plasma, like I've mentioned before, is the liquid portion of blood. It has a yellowish color, and it contains, or it is about 55% of blood's volume. So blood contains 45% cells, let's say, and 55% plasma, non-cellular fluid. And as 55% of the blood, this is going to be represented as the liquid portion of blood, and also we can classify this as a non-cellular portion of blood. So a lot of sort of classifications for plasma. So it contains all of these following characteristics. It also has, like I mentioned, a yellowish color. Of the 55% of blood that's plasma, 92% um, of plasma is water. So it's basically water-based. And we can take a look and understanding of plasma by looking at figure 42.16. So figure 42.16 gives us a good look at plasma as a constituent of blood. But let's look at how plasma functions in the overall role uh, that it has within blood. And there are two main things that plasma possesses. Plasma, as the liquid portion of blood, contains plasma proteins. Plasma proteins are going to be defined as the following. Whenever we're talking about these, we're talking about structures, proteins, that help regulate, 
the distribution of fluid, so this is basically fluid balance, one of our functions of blood being manifested by plasma proteins, help regulate the distribution of fluid um, between, there's two portions that are basically going to be fighting each other. That is plasma and also ISF. You remember that antagonistic relationship between blood pressure and osmotic pressure. And also, plasma proteins will also act as buffers. So they act as buffers as well. Two main functions of plasma proteins act as buffers and help regulate the distribution of fluid between plasma and ISF. In addition, what we can state about plasma proteins is the following. These are going to generally um, increase osmotic pressure. So we'll state that plasma proteins will increase OP for osmotic pressure. And this means that they will generally be involved in making sure that fluid returns to capillaries. Because if we remember from our antagonistic relationship between blood pressure and osmotic pressure, if osmotic pressure is high, it will defeat blood pressure, and we will get that fluid that's on sort of the outsides of cells to go back into the capillaries and back into circulation. So plasma proteins increase osmotic pressure. This is going to result in fluid returning back to capillaries. Again, this is a fluid balance function being manifested by these proteins. There are some specific proteins to take note of, namely albumin. So this is a plasma protein found within the plasma of blood. This is going to be functional in regulating pH. Albumin regulates pH. And in addition to regulating pH, albumin is also going to be involved in fluid balance. That's a big theme here with plasma and the proteins that, constitu that make up plasma. So we have fluid balance here, and that's specifically between, of course, blood and ISF, blood pressure versus osmotic pressure, both of which are going to be influenced by albumin. In addition, plasma proteins will include immunoglobulins. These are going to be within plasma as well. These are going to be, in other words, antibodies. More on this when we talk about immunity, but for right now, just understand antibodies as uh, things that are going to be uh, serve a role as defenders against, pat against invaders, we'll say here. So any foreign invaders that enter, they're going to be defended against via these antibodies. And that whole idea is going to be looked at when we talk about the immune system. So again, these are plasma proteins. They're not cells. These are just proteins because plasma is non-cellular. We'll talk about these cells, red blood cells and white blood cells and platelets, a little bit later. But right now, we're only talking about non-cellular plasma proteins. The protein apolipoprotein will also be present here. So apolipoproteins will also be a part of the plasma protein. These are involved in lipid transport. And this is important, very important, in the overall transport of materials, as we stated previously in the function of blood, because of the following reason. We will say that lipid transport is vital because lipids themselves are generally insoluble. They do not dissolve in blood. They need to be carried by a protein. And therefore, we use apolipoproteins within the blood to carry these lipids. So we can state that any lipid that needs to be transported needs to be uh, bound to some sort of protein. And that's what apolipoproteins serve a role, serve their role as. These lipid transport proteins within plasma. And we also are going to see proteins known as fibrinogens. Let me rewrite that here. Fibrinogens. These are just going to be plasma proteins very important in blood clotting. They will come up later when we talk about platelets and their role in blood clotting. They both work together. Finally, the last thing to state about plasma proteins is that if you're ever looking at the serum of blood, serum is just going to be equal to plasma, the, this 55% portion of blood, the liquid portion of blood, minus the fibrinogens, minus these blood clotting factors, will give you the serum of blood. This is what serum is. And this can be useful in detecting many different things and useful in diagnostics when we talk about medicine or healthcare, let's say. That covers our look at plasma proteins. Last thing about plasma I want to cover are just another portion that's found within plasma, um, that, and those are blood electrolytes. 
And blood electrolytes are going to be generally just inorganic salts that are dissolved within the plasma because plasma is mainly water and water mixes with salt pretty nicely. So we have dissolved ions, in other words. Blood electrolytes are inorganic salts that are dissolved ions within this water liquidy portion of blood. Their job will be to serve as buffers, buffers specifically against pH changes. We want to maintain the pH of blood at around 7.4. So we'll state here pH is equal to 7.4. We want to keep it about there, and we make sure we keep it there with these blood electrolytes. Blood electrolytes will also be important in maintaining osmotic balance because they are salts. And therefore, they will be useful in some sort of hypertonic-hypotonic relationship. They make sure that water goes where it's supposed to go when it's traveling through the blood in the form of plasma. And also, blood electrolytes will be found within the ISF as well. So remember, ISF is when plasma leaves the circulatory system and goes to some sort of tissue and starts bathing the tissue. When it starts bathing the tissue, there will still be blood electrolytes within that ISF fluid now that will be useful in maintaining osmotic balance of tissues and buffering against pH changes in tissues because it's now in ISF as well. That covers our first background look at blood. We'll continue our discussion on blood and its components in the next video.